Lindsay, you, you see that picture of, of Steve then, and um, I, that really evokes what I think of as, 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 as Steve's kind of thoughtful, mature, kind of slightly worldly wise, but rather humane kind of weight, his, his authority, the way he did that. And I swear to God, I first met him when he was 22, I think, and a year younger than me, and he had it all then. I mean, he, he had exactly that been there, done that quality, and was giving advice to everyone about journalism at the age of 22. That was him. <laughs> um, and Steve, I mean, I, I, I knew Steve and saw him regularly over, over, I guess, four decades, really. And it's like different stages. I mean, newbies together. He didn't look like a newbie, but like, like me, he was starting from scratch to becoming kind of proper colleagues to different career paths, sometimes a little bit of rivalry in the mix. Um, then Steve, Steve became a media uh, reporter and columnist, and you know, this is now becomes a bit of cat and mouse with me definitely generally playing the role of the mouse. Um, uh, and Steve then as the interrogator, you know, interviewing me uh, you know, either on the record for, for The Guardian and sometimes on the air as well. Um, but we were always friends. Uh, always friends, and I always, always trusted Steve's fairness, his um, sense of proportion, uh, his kind of distance. He had that business so easy for people to get sucked into the into the somewhere's rather sad little world of media. And Steve actually never forgot to be a human being and look from the outside. Um, so this, I'll tell you about the last time I, I saw Steve Hewlett, um, and um, we. We live in New York, and my, my wife, uh, Jane, has uh, Radio 4 piped in every part of our apartment. And um, like many, millions of other people, um, Jane got very engrossed by the incredible uh, series of conversations and reports that Steve did with Eddie Mayer on PM. Um, I, I often didn't hear them because I, I, was, I was away at work, but, but uh, given the time difference, but she heard them. And she said at a certain po point to me, I guess in probably late October, November, you've got to see Steve. And I, I'd already seen, I'd spoken to Steve probably four or five times in the previous six months, and I'd, I'd seen him as well, um, gone to London and see him. But he said, you've got, you've got to see him, and you take him out and give him a cup of tea. So I, I emailed, I, 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 I emailed uh, Steve and, and, and said, why, why don't we meet for a cup of tea? And in a classic Steve Hewlett way, he said, yes, as long as I can interview on the media show at the same time. <laughs> so, so we, <laughs> which I said yes. So I turned up uh, and did my, did my business. Um, uh, the other interviewee was uh, uh, Mark Damaso. I think he's crept in at the back. Uh, Mark had been, was being interviewed I think he was trying to make the case for the continuance of the BBC Trust. <laughs> good, good luck on that. Uh, um, but, but afterwards, the three of us, there's a little, in the new plaza, the new broadcasting house plaza, there's a little kind of coffee shop, and we, we sat in the coffee shop and had a cup of tea, and it was, it was kind of, for those people who remember, it was like an episode of Last of the Summer Wine. Uh, um, of these three old uh, 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 stages, as we now all, all were, uh, chewing, chewing the cud, and, and actually Steve had a kind of compo-like woolly hat. Was, he was feeling the cold at this point, and uh, uh, I want to say I miss him. I mean, I, I, I really miss him. I miss, uh, uh, I think, something which, which has, has gone with him uh, around common sense and distance and, and, and a kind of human wisdom uh, looking at our world, and we all miss him. Um, uh, I think, by the way, the Steve Hewlett Fund and the scholarships it supports are a good thing. I, 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 I support it. I think you should think about supporting it. I think it's a great way of remembering Steve and of, of, of making sure that we continue to get really able people into our industry as, as, as journalists. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, it's, so, it's so nice to see, see uh, Rachel Steve's wife here and I think all three, all three sons, all three... Uh, uh, the next generation of the Hewlett, so, so thank you for that. I, I feel really, really privileged to, to, to be here and to be talking and giving this, this Steve Hewlett lecture. So, on to business. Um, so my subject this evening is sovereignty. Um, <laughs> yeah. There's, there's a little bit of fake news there. I, I, the, the way... <laughs> I'm afraid there isn't going to be much about Brexit tonight, and sadly, absolutely no insights into 
today's riveting developments. And I have to say, I'm very, very pleased you're all here. I think I, if I had a choice, we'd be at home watching the news. Um, and in fact, the, 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 the stuff I want to talk about, the questions I want to raise, don't depend on, on whether Brexit goes ahead or not. Um, I think they'll still really count whether we, we stick with the Ode to Joy or head down to the pub with Boris and Nigel for a chorus of Roll Out the Barrel. Um, or even if it turns out that um, we've all been characters in the play by Samuel Beckett all along and the whole point was nothing ever happens. <laughs> now, a number of people, Claire Enders in particular, have used uh, this, this, the word sovereignty um, in the debate about media uh, before. I think they've generally meant to press the case for um, proper national um, oversight and regulation of digital content and services. That's a compelling case, at least in a democracy. I'm a bit less comfortable when Xi Jinping uses the phrase cyber sovereignty to justify the suppression of free speech in China. But I want to try and use this word sovereignty um, in a much more expansive way to refer to our ability in the UK to fully express ourselves and our many stories and opinions and traditions to each other and the world. And if you claim that the concerns which led to the Brexit debacle relate to political rather than this kind of cultural sovereignty, my reply is it's impossible to separate the two, that national self-expression, recognizing your language, your life experience, your community and the prevailing culture, is not just an important element, but a necessary precondition for national self-determination and a sense of individual and collective agency. A society which loses its shared culture loses much of its distinctive identity. A society in which different communities and groups can no longer listen to and come to understand each other's pasts and presents shouldn't be surprised if mutual incomprehension and division are the consequences. And if you doubt that any of this connects to big politics and national well-being, you're really not paying enough attention. Now, of course, our culture contains much more than media, language, literature, education, theatre, music, dance, the visual arts, much else besides. But I doubt that anyone would deny the centrality of media, digital media, regular TV and radio, movies, newspapers and magazines, local and national, in our, in our life here in Britain. But to state the obvious, many of these kinds of media and therefore much of our cultural sovereignty are now under economic and audience threat from a process of digital disintegration and reinvention that is still accelerating, indeed in many areas just getting going, and particularly from its globalizing effects, which are driven not just by the borderless character of digital distribution, but by its intrinsic scale economics. It's hard for anyone other than the US and China to produce global digital platforms. The UK hasn't produced one, nor has any other European country, with the arguable exception of Sweden and Spotify. British creators make first-class programs for Netflix, Amazon, and the other American streamers. But there's a crucial difference between producing great content to fit somebody else's creative brief and commissioning and controlling it yourself. It's the commissioners who decide what, get, what gets made and who reap most of the economic upside. If real scale is what it takes in digital distribution, we don't have a horse in that race either. Indeed, one of the triumphs of British policy making over the last decade or so has been to hobble the chances of the UK's only credible global contender, the BBC, of fulfilling its full potential to bring British talent and British ideas to the world's audiences. More on that later. Sky, another great international broadcaster with a strong track record of digital risk-taking and innovation, won't face the same obstacles as the BBC. And I'm sure it will continue to commission plenty of outstanding British shows. But it's also a fact that Sky is no longer an independent publicly quoted British company, but itself a unit within Comcast, another of those US megaliths, which quite understandably has global ambitions and priorities of its own. The UK media scene has changed greatly in the seven years since I moved to New York. Local and regional media has its back to the wall. 
the long-term future of national newspapers and public service and ad-funded commercial TV is clearly in question. But what hasn't changed much, if at all, is British public policy about media. Policymakers have largely concentrated on tightening the funding pressure and other constraints on the BBC still further, refining technocratic regulatory theory, and pondering such weighty matters as whether the Times and Sunday Times of London should be allowed to share some editorial resources. The answer, after much deliberation, being a cautious yes. One can be forgiven for wondering if that's a complete solution to the crisis threatening to engulf British journalism. Now, no doubt the relevant government departments and regulators do plenty of good work also across this difficult and rapidly evolving terrain. But I want to say to them, policing the beach for litter is a virtuous activity, but it may be time to glance out to sea. That grey band on the horizon is a tsunami. Now, the idea that Netflix and others are changing the game in broadcasting is hardly news, of course. It was a big theme of last week's RTS Cambridge Convention. As for digital disruption of newspapers, that's been with us for years. What I hope to bring to the party this evening is my experience of leading a large-scale and broadly encouraging response to that digital tsunami. I hope that this experience, with real audiences, a real creative organisation, real technology and real dollars will help convince you that successful transformation is possible, at least for legacy players who accept the daunting investment and drastic change required. But it's also, I believe, a useful perspective from which to view and propose changes to current UK media policy. So I'm going to proceed as follows. First, I'll talk about the perilous and seemingly intractable set of threats that faced the New York Times when I walked into the lobby as chief executive in late 2012. I'll tell you how we responded, draw some general lessons from that, lessons which, by the way, in my view, are just as relevant for TV, movies, radio and music as they are for the news business. And then I'll apply them to today's British media landscape. And finally, I'll turn to the question of public policy. So let's start with the New York Times. In 2012, it was still a profitable cash-generative company. Its journalism was as strong as ever. It had been an early investor in digital, and its website was still re recognised as a market leader. But pretty much every economic indicator was trending down. Print advertising, which had collapsed during 2008-9, was still falling like a stone. The number of print subscribers was also falling, albeit more gradually. Newsstand sales were plummeting. To everyone's consternation, after years of growth, digital advertising was also going into reverse. And even the digital subscription model, launched the previous year, and the company's great hope, seemed to be running out of steam at around the 600,000 subscriber mark. Innovation had stalled. Strategy was at a stand. And it remained a largely analog company, not just in revenue, but in spirit and expertise. But terrifyingly, it was nevertheless one of the highest performers in the entire US industry. Since 2004, more than one in five US newspapers has closed. Employment in the industry fell from over 400,000 in the year 2000 to 140,000 last year. That's nearly, a two th that's nearly two thirds attrition. And it's not just the closures, even the survivors have been savaging newsroom headcount. More journalists have lost their job in recent years in America than coal miners. The economic object of any legacy media digital strategy has to be to develop digital products and services which can grow revenue and profitability aggressively enough to offset the inevitable declines in print. Most American newspapers in 2012 were finding it impossible to do this very simply stated but rather daunting benchmark, and most of them still are. A significant recession in the next year or so will likely decimate the survivors and leave great swathes of America without any professional newspaper journalists at all and none of the accountability they used to provide. One can't look at this country or much of Western Europe and not fear something very similar. Now, the New York Times did have important advantages. Its brand heritage, 
the obstinate determination of the Ox Salzburger family and of the board not to savage the newsroom, no matter how bleak the forward economics looked. It's digital head start and it's untapped global potential. Now, these were all strengths to build on, though quite how they should be built on was still unclear. And Wall Street, which is not known for its sentimentality, had reached a verdict, which was that the Times was the best of a bad lot. The stock price, which had touched $50 a share at its peak, was stuck at around $8. So what do we do? Well, over the next few years, we devised and executed a strategy which had the following central tenets. First, we believe in journalism. It's what we stand for. It's also the only thing we have to sell. So unlike almost everyone else, we've invested in journalism. We now have around 1,750 journalists working for the New York Times. That's 300 more than in 2012, and the greatest number in our company's 170-year-old history. Heavy investment in content is Netflix strategy. It's Disney strategy. They know that distinctiveness, providing something clearly different, more valuable, more trustworthy than what's available for nothing on the internet, is essential. Distinctiveness is a no-brainer if you want to succeed as a provider of high-quality digital content of any kind. A good slice of our investment has gone into building classic journalistic breadth and strength. Take investigations. Now, you may be familiar with some of the Times' work in investigative journalism. Harvey Weinstein and Bill O'Reilly, Trump's taxes and so on. But what I want to stress is the sheer number of original stories the New York Times delivers every week. It's a drumbeat of high-impact headlines, previously unknown anywhere in digital print or broadcasting. We've also invested in new specialists in critical areas like tech and climate. We delivered more than 800 stories on climate last year, as well as in video, audio, and other media. But by contrast, instead of investing, most of the world's news organizations have either chosen or been forced to try and cut their way to a digital future. Now, cutting may drive higher short-term profitability, but it's a strategy that leads off a cliff. You can't degrade your journalism and keep your audience, let alone sell them subscriptions. This is unavoidably a capital-intensive period in media history. You have to invest, and not just in content, but in data science, digital product, engineering. We now have around 900 specialists, in addition to that big newsroom, working on our digital machine. Most are new to the company. And there's a difference, a big difference we had to learn between trying digital, if that means letting a handful of people play around the edges of the business. The difference between that and trying as if the company's life depends on it, which it does. You have to throw everything and almost everyone into the fight. This level of commitment and investment is hard for publicly quoted companies who find themselves competing for creative and engineering talent and for the best intellectual property assets with tech players who typically have either vast cash reserves or access to seemingly unlimited venture capital. But building an arc doesn't come cheap. Next, we believe in developing close, long-term relationships with the most engaged consumers of our journalism, with the current hypothesis that the single best way to turn these relationships into revenue is by converting these very loyal users into paying customers. Now, until fairly recently, very few people in news publishing found that credible. People just wouldn't pay for news on digital devices, we were told. Indeed, many were amazed when the New York Times reached even half a million subscribers. But today, most print and digital players, many digital players anyway, are trying to follow us. But meanwhile, in ad-funded TV and radio, almost no one on either side of the Atlantic is contemplating more than a marginal shift towards direct end-user subscriptions. Indeed, some have instead been licensing their libraries to Netflix and the other streamers. In other words, taking cash in return for helping to build the very platforms who are hoping to replace them. 
It's only very recently that legacy players have spotted the strategic danger of that tactic. A relationship strategy depends less on page views and, and click-through rates than it does on engagement and frequency. In other words, how deeply and how often a given reader uses you. So we poured people and money into the task of improving the digital experience of the New York Times and optimising the pay model and our subscription tactics. From 2014, we focused most of our efforts on the mobile phone experience because that's where the users are. Peak time for news consumption on mobile phones is seven in the morning. So the whole circadian rhythm of the newsroom had to change. We invented new regular experiences and features, morning and evening, evening briefings, a mini crossword every morning, for instance, to encourage return visits. One way to think about our breakthrough podcast, The Daily, is as a habituation tool it now reaches 2 million listeners on a typical day, 10 in a month, and it's still growing. We've experimented everywhere and with everything. At any given moment, we now have multiple simultaneous, thanks, simultaneous separate experiments running in the field. We've launched successful new products. Our digital crossword and cooking products are in their own right two of the news industry's largest subscription products. But we've also launched unsuccessful ones and had to stop them. We started taking international digital subgrowth, subscription growth seriously. International subscriptions have grown tenfold since 2012. A new generation of leaders arrived in the company. We massively expanded training. As the business changed, so did large sections of the employee uh, base. In some departments, the need for different skills and expertise meant as much as an 85% change in the workforce. So quite painful, um, some of the changes that we've been making. But today, growth in digital revenue, revenue comfortably outstrips print losses. Company revenue is now growing quarter over quarter. At the end of our most recently disclosed quarter, we had around 5 million total subscriptions, triple the highest number ever achieved in the print era. And we plan to double that again to 10 million by 2025. Far from plateauing as our submodel enters its ninth year, in recent quarters, the rate at which we're adding new digital subscribers has accelerated again. And our projections suggest our ultimate ambition should be much, much larger even than that 10 million figure. In 2015, we set ourselves what then seemed like the very daunting target of doubling digital revenue from 400 to $800 million a year uh, by 2020. But we'll hit that target, I think, well ahead of schedule and for what it's worth, our stock price has gone up by, I guess, three and a half times since, uh, since 2012. Now, we're not there yet. Honestly, I think no one in digital is there yet. Perhaps never will be there if, if being there means a completely secure and stable end state. But we are on our way again. So how applicable is this experience to media more broadly, and in particular, media in the UK? In my view, and despite the unique features of the New York Times, I think it's very applicable. First, it helps us dispel some persistent myths. The first is that digital advertising can support quality journalism on its own. It can't. In fact, it was never going to. Most of the spoils of advertising go to those who control distribution. Once, that was newspapers and magazines. Now it's the major Silicon Valley platforms. The distribution advantage we once enjoyed with our presses and our trucks has already shrunk, and soon it'll be gone forever. Now, we're building a different kind of digital advertising at the New York Times based around strategic partnerships with the world's biggest brands, and it's showing real promise. But that's an option only available to a handful of publishers. Unless the others can pivot away from dependence on advertising, to subscription or some other revenue stream, the future looks bleak. And that includes not just legacy firms, but former digital darlings like the Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, and the rest. Players who today look more like legacy publishers, but without an actual legacy. The fact that TV advertising has yet to go through this same scale of disruption is, in my view, only a timing issue. 
It's inevitable as audiences switch from privileged, tradition, uh, to privileged traditional distribution channels to digital. Exactly the same economic logic applies. And linear broadcasters everywhere are also undergoing the same ominous early stage of audience loss that hits the, hit the West newspapers years ago, particularly a differential flight of the young. Effective countermeasures are possible. The Daily, that podcast of ours, is by many measures the most popular news podcast in the world. But it's also reaching and deeply engaging a significantly new audience for us. Three quarters of that audience is 40 or under. 45 are 30 years old or under. Now, I grew up in broadcasting being told by everyone that very few young people would ever listen to serious speech audio. It turns out to be rubbish, and it probably always was rubbish. All you have to do was go to them and listen to them and figure out what they wanted. Bucking the trend by doing things like the day not only requires investment, but creativity and lateral thinking. But there's a simple reality, which is any media company which fails to crack this problem and can no longer replenish its audience doesn't have a long-term future. The effects may not be immediate, older audiences are typically very loyal, but it's ultimately non-survivable. It's as simple as that. Myth number two is that it's all Google and Facebook's fault. They stole our business and something must be done about it. Now, it's convenient to have someone else to blame for your woes. And it's true that policymakers and regulators across the Western world have any number of searching questions to put to these two giants about their business practices. And yes, Google and Facebook should do a lot more to help news publishers and other providers of civically and culturally valuable content. Google has indeed taken some modest but promising steps. Facebook is talking seriously about doing the same. But let's be realistic. The true source of legacy media's tribulations is not these two companies and wouldn't be solved if they were regulated more tightly or even replaced by other search and social providers. The true culprit, culprit is the internet itself. It was the internet which allowed hundreds of millions of users to switch from old media distribution to digital. It was the internet which robbed newspapers and is now beginning to rob linear TV of the advertising pricing power they used to enjoy. It's the internet. And the politician or regulator has yet to be born who can uninvent that rather magnificent but scarifying Pandora's box. We're stuck with it and therefore, in my view, might as well make the most of it. But for those brave souls, whether in news or entertainment, who opt to truly take the plunge, what are the fundamental conditions for success of really embracing the digital opportunity? Firstly, scale. You need scale of audience, scale of engagement, scale of subscriptions. The goal, economically, is to reach the point at which operating leverage begins to rise. In other words, that moment in a company's arc of digital growth, beyond which investment and other costs no longer need to rise at, at the same pace as revenue, and the fundamental profitability of the business begins to improve. Say um, at the New York Times we spend X hundreds of millions of dollars a year on journalism to serve five million subscribers. We won't have to spend 2x, we won't have to spend twice as much to serve 10 million, nor 2x on product and technology or many of the company's other expenses. Now some costs know that will continue to rise. But going forward, margin, by which I mean the gap between total revenue and total cost, will grow wider and wider. So we see not just a viable, fully digital news business in prospect, but an increasingly profitable one. But that's impossible without scale and without that initial high investment. The next condition is to have a really clear value proposition for your customers, one that meets real world demand and reflects real world media consumption. At the New York Times, we know what our mission is to seek the truth and help people understand the world. Our research suggests enormous and indeed growing global demand for serious news. 
I've already talked about how we hope to satisfy that demand and about the critical role of quality and originality in our offering. And we're not alone. It's no coincidence that all the really successful digital subscription models in news come from titles at the top of the market. The future looks much tougher in the middle and bottom of the market. If your journalism isn't special enough to sell to consumers and you're losing out in the ad market to the major digital platforms, it's hard to see how you keep your head above water. Now, some of the same dynamics, I think, are beginning to play out in the unfolding global battle for the future of TV. The streamers may drive much of their current consumption with reruns of conventional broadcasting, but they're putting their commissioning dollars into exactly the kind of distinctive, ambitious programming which used to be the preserve of premium cable and satellite, HBO or Showtime, say, or indeed the BBC and Channel 4. It's not reality shows and soaps, but Fleabag and The Crown. And the best US linear players are fighting back with the same kind of recipe, the terror, Chernobyl, even Game of Thrones. Now, perhaps you saw some of these pieces on conventional British TV channels, but that too is a timing issue. For now, it makes sense for the streamers to co-produce and share rights in the country of the origin of the production. But you shouldn't expect that to last. Soon, Netflix and Amazon and the others will want it all. And given the competitive struggle that's now gaining momentum, they'll probably need it all too. Conventional broadcasters, and I include conventional cable and satellite players, but the conventional broadcasters who do not have a compelling pure play digital strategy of their own risk being priced out of the best talent and the best content. Even in their heyday, they'd have struggled to compete with these giants. And now with ad revenue in the case, and in the case of the BBC, license fee income squeezed, their financial firepower, especially their relative financial firepower, is waning. And note also the impact of all of this on some of the traditional arguments for public service intervention. The great, that list of great programmes I mentioned come out of a British creative culture and a talent base which the UK public service broadcasters have nurtured and sustained and conditioned audiences to expect. But will that role still be as critical in the future as the global players ramp up their investment in their own exceptional high-risk work? One could ask a similar question about purely financial support for the UK production sector. Last week at Cambridge, Reed Hastings announced that Netflix is spending half a billion dollars this year on British film and TV. Does that mean that the BBC and Channel 4's investment is becoming less vital? And finally, there's trust. According to data Ed Williams of Edelman presented at the RTS last week, Netflix net trust score in the UK is now on a par with the BBC's and actually a point ahead of Channel 4's. If the PSB's ever enjoyed a special status with British audiences when it came to trust, that too now seems to be in question. Now, as you'll hear, I believe the case for public intervention in media is stronger than ever, and indeed that in many categories, aggregate market failure and the risk of it is manifestly growing. Nonetheless, the case for it needs not just to be restated, but significantly refined and sharpened. The third lesson and the third condition for success in digital is the how. How do you build an effective digital media operation? In my view, it requires what is in many regards a new operation. Much of your existing tech and data architecture needs to go in the skip, or in my case, the dumpster. <laughs> Everything needs to be rebuilt. So too, those traditional functional departments with their hierarchies and territories. At the New York Times, we organize now specifically around digital missions, an engagement mission, a subscription growth mission, and so on with multidisciplinary teams drawn from many fields, working under unified leadership to achieve specific strategic goals. They test, they learn, they make most of the decisions inside the team and almost always without needing sign off either from department heads, let alone senior management. 
Most legacy media structures are still shaped around the old rather than the new business. They still operate with traditional pyramid-shaped command and control. I think that's one of the main reasons why so many are seeing rather disappointing results from their digital efforts. You can't invent the future if you're spending, as a leader, 80% of your time on legacy operations. Hive them off, even if they're currently driving the biggest audiences and the biggest revenue. Everyone in your company knows them backwards. Get a handful of trusted colleagues to look after them so that everyone else can concentrate on the new and the harder task. And if you're a leader, get retrained yourself. You can't wing this stuff on instinct and vague memories of business school. At the New York Times, I and my colleagues um, at the top of the organization are literally back in the classroom and we're doing a graduate level course in statistics and data science so we can understand our own business properly. Of all the ills afflicting the world's legacy media companies and organizations, ignorant, risk averse, outwardly confident, inwardly defeatist leadership is probably the most dangerous. No one can bluster or lobby their way out of this one, but plenty are still trying. So, how does Britain's media industry shape up when we look at it through this rather pitiless lens? Well, I think the great news is that the future of the UK's pool of talent, its writers, its actors, directors, producers, designer, and its great crafts, and indeed the very best of its journalistic talent, I think the future for them looks better than ever. The independent production sector posted a record three billion in revenues last year, and there's no reason why, given the growing global appetite, this inward investment shouldn't grow much further. Unfortunately, that's where the really good news runs out. The media world is dividing into a small number of potential global winners, probable survivors, and the rest. Now, the UK certainly has probable survivors. Amongst national newspapers, for example, the Daily Mail and the Guardian, particularly uh, the Guardian recently, are good examples. But with due respect, and notwithstanding the sizable international audiences which several UK newspapers have notched up, no, no, one, no one here looks like a potential global winner. Indeed, none has achieved even the digital transformation of a shipstead, the great Scandinavian company, or the digital diversification of a NASPERS or Springer, Axel Springer. The UK players' heritage is substantially domestic, and most have yet to change that, and to also to change their still pretty print-centric ways of working. I don't see how all the current national titles survive. And at regional and local level, it looks like something close to a wipeout without dramatic intervention. Now, the BBC's, the, the, the UK's established broadcasters still have deep roots in the national consciousness. They still command great audiences. Their current schedules and their extensive libraries still speak to many of those aspects of collective, collective identity and national self-expression I mentioned at the start. But none look strong enough to be a true contender in the coming global contest. All are seeing adverse trends which are very familiar from other digital disruption stories, trends that can very quickly turn from being disquieting to being terminal. We've talked about the loss of the best talent and projects to the digital insurgents and the inevitable loss of linear advertising revenue. Both are becoming realities in UK broadcasting, as is the arterial and, as I've said, ultimately insupportable loss of young audiences. BBC One's average audience is 61. The average uh, of the audience, average age of the audience for the main channel four, the youthful, edgy alternative to BBC One, is 55. <laughs> Effectively reaching younger audiences is creatively hard and culturally difficult, even for relatively recent legacy arrivals. And for the BBC, it's also harder to justify to an establishment 
which tends to assume that if it's aimed at the young, it must be nakedly commercial. But BBC Three bucked the trend. It's delivered more than its fair share of award winners, but at its peak, it had a larger share of 16 to 34 year old viewing in the UK than Channel 4, and a reach among 16 to 34 year olds of nearly 30%. And yet when the BBC was forced to share the television service for financial reasons a few years ago, it was the one chosen to go. Online only, its reach among 16 to 34s has declined to less than 10%. Now that switch to digital was ultimately inevitable given the young's progressive move away from analogue. But the broadcast window was still helping BBC Three build precious familiarity and loyalty. And it was an important signal to this audience about the BBC's commitment to them. And unfortunately, removing it was a significant signal too. Now, the BBC as a whole should be a shoe in as a probable global winner. It's the only British media brand with truly global recognition and potential. Its international audience runs in the hundreds of millions. Its indispensable presence in the lives of most British households is a testament not just to its heritage, but to the talent it still attracts and the creativity and excellence it still fosters. But at a moment when the UK contemplates setting out on a brave new voyage in search of new friends and new global markets, we can't put Britain's media flag carrier on the list. And that's because of an essentially hostile public policy stance to the BBC, which began to coalesce more than a decade ago, but which has hardened notably in recent years. One of its fruits was the 2015 uh, license fee settlement, which included the disastrous withdrawal of government funding of free license fees for the over 75s. In their excellent forthcoming book, The War on the BBC, Patrick Barwise and Peter York chronicle the orche orchestrated campaign that in part led to that moment, a campaign which involved politicians, commercial media interests, think tanks and other lobbying organisations, as well as the popular press. The campaign was grounded in gross distortion, exaggeration and straightforward lies. The canard, canard for, for example, promoted amongst others by the Daily Mail that the BBC spent less than half the licence fee on programmes. The true number at the time, even on the narrowest reasonable assumptions, was 78% of the total. The last words uttered in the outstanding HBO Sky co-production Chernobyl are the question, what is the cost of lies? Unless policy towards the BBC changes, a policy to a significant extent politically predicated on lies and distortions, we may soon find out. Indeed, if one was a conspiracist, one might almost wonder if the players behind that campaign that led to the 2015 settlement weren't using it as a kind of test run for an even more ambitious project. The question of funding is only one of the blockers which the BBC faces. Equally damaging has been an officious governmental and regulatory environment which has sought to stymie or limit digital transformation and innovation by the BBC as much as possible. The threat of the global TV streamers, not just to the BBC, but to every British broadcaster and channel operator, wasn't just foreseeable, it was foreseen. In 2007, just before we launched the iPlayer, I had a conversation in Silicon Valley with Reed Hastings, who was then just about to unveil Netflix's own new streaming service. So it was an important moment for him, just as the iPlayer was for us. And of the iPlayer, Reid said, I don't know why you're bothering, Mark. You'll never beat my algorithm. Why not just give us all your content instead? <laughs> now, Reid is genuinely one of the most impressive business leaders I've met. And I have to say, particularly since I've been at the New York Times, He's given me regular doses of pretty damn candid, but also very useful advice. However, I came back to the UK, 2007, from this and other similar meetings on the West Coast, with an utterly clear conviction 
that we absolutely must make a success of the iPlayer, but that we should also urgently try and find a global streaming solution, not just for the BBC, but for the whole of British television. Why shouldn't the UK, UK's broadcasters develop their own collective worldwide platform to project British talent and British content to audiences everywhere? This idea, which we dubbed Project Kangaroo, quickly gained the support of the other UK PSBs, but was blocked in early 2009 by the UK Competition Commission, who cited local market competition concerns. Another eight years would go by before the launch of the altogether more modest Britbox. In the breakneck rush of digital transformation, eight years is an eternity. Now, I'm not suggesting that Kangaroo could have achieved the scale of a Netflix, but I do believe it could have given the UK far more agency and economic upside in the world streaming market than it enjoys today. And Kangaroo's fate speaks of a particularly, particularly British at, uh, attitude and approach to the BBC and media policy more broadly, which is essentially to talk global but act parochial. Indeed, in our blinkered discourse about media, the more extravagant the talk of global opportunity, the more narrow and inward-looking the actual worldview is likely to be. If we're serious about opening up new international market opportunities, why wouldn't we unleash our only truly global media brand and exploit it not just to bring a British perspective to audiences everywhere, but to introduce and project the work of the rest of the British creative sector as well? The answer, I guess, because it might offend local political influencers, because our approach to digital competition regulation hasn't caught up yet, because moving quickly and boldly is really rather un-British and probably best left to Americans and other foreigners. Now, all these controls and obstacles have a similar effect, which is to discourage and punish innovation, and as far as possible to keep the BBC locked up in its traditional broadcasting box. And this despite, or indeed perhaps because of the fact that everyone knows that linear broadcasting is time limited and will one day come to a full stop. Now radio will probably fare better. It's sticky and relatively cheap to make. It's readily relocatable to digital devices and environments. And indeed in some country, countries, including this one, it may be the last lifeline for those without the money to pay for high quality news music, documentary, and entertainment. But even here, talent may become a problem. In the US, we're already seeing a brain drain of some of the best creative talent in audio to the flourishing and increasingly lucrative world of podcasting. And as for ITV Channel 4 and the other broadcasters who today depend disproportionately on advertising for their revenue, I don't see much alternative to the kind of root and branch transformation we've undertaken at the New York Times. I don't know what the new revenue mix should be between subscription, free sponsorship, e-commerce, retrans and other rights fees and digital diversification, but they still have time to find the right answer. Although I think a lesson of the earlier cases of music and newspaper is it always seems to be less time than you think it is. So how should British policymakers respond to all of this? To provide a context for my answer, I want to turn briefly back to another pivotal moment in British history, the end of the Second World War, to lay out two contrasting views of the future of this country and its cultures. The first is the most famous dystopia of them all, 1984. Now, when the Berlin Wall fell, many people assumed that whatever its literary merits, George Orwell's novel had lost most of its predictive power. History, you were, were, we were told at the time, was now over. Things look a little different today. And the geopolitics of our world has surprising echoes of 1984s, which, you remember, consists of three vast world superpowers, Oceania, uh, Eurasia, and East Asia, each with its own hermetically sealed political and social operating system. And on the home front in the novel, fake news, 
constant surveillance, secret collection of everyone's data, the internet. You'll remember that the telly screen in Winston's apartment has an interactive camera attached to it. And of course, Prol Feed, an endless stream of mindless entertainment to tranquilize the public. In 1984, the UK has lost its freedom and its identity. Now it's called Airstrip One. It's a military platform from which Oceania can wage its wars. Insofar as its citizens enjoy any intellectual or creative autonomy, it's underground, furtive, mortally dangerous. Now compare that with this other notable and almost exactly contemporary vision of future national culture. By provision of concert halls, modern libraries, theatres and suitable centres, we desire to assure our people full access to the great culture, the great heritage of culture in this nation. How satisfactory it would be if different parts of the citizenry would again walk their several ways as they once did. Let every part of merry England be merry in its own way. Death to Hollywood. <laughs> so, Britain is still at war at this moment with Japan. The gigantic task of post-war reconstruction has yet to begin. But John Maynard Keynes is talking arts policy on the BBC's third programme. It's July 1945, and he's the first chairman of a new institution, the Arts Council. In those days, even a world war couldn't stop imaginative British policymaking. Something perhaps to bear in mind in these listless trans Brexit weeks. So, John Keynes' words. You could argue, pretty paternalistic. They're certainly pretty awkward, satisfactory, <laughs> uh, and all the rest of it. And they're maybe red redolent of the elitism which critics of the BBC and other public cultural uh, institutions are always latched onto, and sometimes with justice. But the vision is still captivating. The vision which recognises that national culture isn't one entity, but a manifold of different experiences and stories and traditions. It isn't just inherited, it's alive. And Keynes doesn't suggest it should be imposed on the population or even made accessible, but chosen, owned, and in a way, even controlled by them. It's a vision, in other words, of cultural sovereignty, which is not in fact a post-war liberal invention at all, but parts of a centuries old British understanding of the societal centrality of culture, which stretches back past the founding of the BBC past the early 20th century national development of rep repertory theatre, to the mid-Victorian establishment of free public libraries, perhaps even to the creation of the British Museum. And then John Maynard, Cray Maynard Keynes cries, death to Hollywood. <laughs> now, I don't think he's really wishing murder down upon America's global entertainment machine. Then, as now, Hollywood was capable of outstanding original work, and then, as now, British audiences flock to it. Now, I think Keynes is merely suggesting that something vital would be lost if Hollywood product was all that the British public saw. In his conception, the central purpose of the Arts Council was to make sure that our own talent and our own voices were not entirely replaced by what were even then global players. It wasn't the fault of Hollywood that it couldn't do justice to the richness and plurality of the British experience. It wasn't their job, any more than it was their job to fully reflect the culture of Nebraska or Rhode Island, for that matter. But there was a risk, Kane implies, of a crowding out, of attention, of funding, of talent. Not quite airstrip one, but perhaps the first fateful steps towards it. This is the central argument for public involvement and intervention in culture and media today. It's no longer enough to say it's to guarantee the public of access to high quality content, nor even that it's about trust in some generic sense of that word. It's specifically to ensure that alongside all the other content, great or otherwise, that they consume, 
that the British public can still find news, drama, comedy, documentary, arts content, which is commissioned out of and whose principal mission is to speak directly to this culture, these communities, these ways of life. Experience suggests, by the way, that original programming conceived with this end in mind often has a truthfulness and energy about it, which allows it to play brilliantly in other markets too. There's no reason, in other words, why it shouldn't play a significant part in that global commercial opportunity for the creative industries. But that's a secondary benefit. The priority must be to serve audiences here. So what is to be done? Well, first, the BBC. Please don't wreck it. It's the only one we've got. The over 75s policy is blatantly expedient and self-evidently flawed. At the least, having agreed to give the BBC the freedom to reform the entitlement, let them get on with it without hindrance. But at best, rethink the whole thing. For all the reasons I've suggested tonight, the UK needs a liberated, properly funded BBC. By no means in all, but in many categories of media, market failure, the economic justification for public intervention is already growing and will worsen in the years ahead. At present, public policy seems to hold that the correct response to failure of private provision, say of a failure of regional and local news provision, you should respond to a private sector problem by carefully limiting public provision as well. Even for those who only accept market failure arguments for the continuation of public service broadcasting must realise that this defies logic and risks exacerbating the loss of quality and choice still further. By all means require that the BBC does what it can to help local commercial media, but give it the means and the regulatory room to do more. The BBC has proven itself more adept at digital innovation and broad transformation than most private media companies in the UK. The iPlayer is only one example. Give the corporation greater freedom to accelerate its own pivot to digital, and also look to it to build products and platforms which can be used for the rest of the industry as well. Rethink the BBC's global role. At present, government funding for the BBC's international services is heavily concentrated on the world's geopolitical hotspots. But our interests, both diplomatic and trade, are far wider than that. Leverage the BBC and use it as a calling card for the whole of the UK creative sector in the world's markets, and indeed for the UK itself. Channel 4 remains an essential creative alternative to the BBC and an enduringly valuable creative catalyst of the entire industry. No brand is better placed to begin to turn the tide when it comes to younger audiences. But Channel 4 needs a serious digital strategy and the wherewithal to deliver it. A job not just for Horse Ferry Road, but Ofcom and government. The shift of the BBC and Channel 4 out of London and into some of the UK's other great creative centres is essential if the country as a whole is to make a successful digital transition. Tony Hall is quite right to deepen the BBC's national and regional commitment still further. Channel 4 too should regard Leeds as a start of its process, not a finish. Government should encourage the whole media industry to play a bigger role in growing national capabilities in digital technology and infrastructure. We need a multi-sector partnership to include the UK's universities to develop and train many more data science and applied machine learning specialists, digital product, UX and design professionals, and to build on existing British strength in the traditional creative areas like journalism here and the, the, the creative digital crafts. In media, the future belongs to those who can do great work in the boundary between content creativity and tech innovation. The UK's great success with gaming and CGI suggests we have a competitive advantage, and that's something we should exploit. The other broadcasters must find their own commercial path to the future, much as we're doing at the New York Times. But let's at least learn the lesson of Project Kangaroo and let them collaborate more freely with each other and with the BBC when it can help with innovation and scale. And let Free Street chart its own future without regulatory distractions. 
Over time, questions of standards and ethics should sort themselves out among the survivors. Quality content is the only kind that actually works in subscription models. And it's worth saying the best advertisers are also becoming pretty choosy about where their brands appear. The UK and its constituent nations need a comprehensive rescue plan for local and regional journalism. No Western country has cracked this yet. Mixed private and public provision, scalable tech, community involvement, higher education, philanthropy, the support of the BBC, the solution will probably have many elements and certainly shouldn't solely consist of a large public check. But without a policy impetus and careful coordination, the present downward spin will continue. Here, more than anywhere, time is running out. Like that moment in the late 1940s, this is not the worst but the best time to address the really big questions about the future of our culture and the place of media within it. It would be great if we could recapture some of the ambition and panache of that glorious post-war zenith of policy creation, but what we need most is action and practical, practical steps, practical reform. It can be done. Successful navigation of the digital storm is not just possible, but may even lead to stronger, better, more sustainable business and institutions. In recent years, I think we've begun to prove that at the New York Times. And to the consternation of cultural pessimists everywhere, we've done it by turning the quality knob up rather than down. No one wants to see the UK turn into a cultural airstrip one. But with newspapers struggling and broadcasters outgunned, it is a clear and present danger. The global digital giants do a great job of providing new choice and often real quality, but it's vital that people here still get access to great news, drama, comedy, documentary made first and foremost for them. But it won't happen if we carry on like this. It won't happen if public policy keeps its head down or maintains a set of hackneyed free market assumptions about the digital future, which haven't changed much since they were first articulated in the 1980s. If we want to save our cultural sovereignty, gov government media policy needs a fundamental change in direction. Instead of the policy of no, no you can't, no that's too dangerous, no one of our political backers wouldn't like that, it needs to turn into a policy of yes, yes to the power of British creativity, yes to the future, above all yes to our own audience and our own culture. Thank you very much.